And good morning, ladies and gentlemen, here on uh, Tuesday morning. I'm glad you're here, and uh, we're going to have a good time today. Got some good questions coming up and some uh, good things to look at uh, on this week. We've got a full week of broadcasting, Monday through Friday. Ask the Theologian right here where you are. Wednesday night, the Feast of Jubilee in our Feast of Israel series. Thursday night, we're in the fourth chapter of the book of James, and uh, looking forward uh, to uh, that. And uh, let's see, Sunday... Uh, I got a sermon. I forgot what the sermon is, but uh, it'll come to me. And also the hermeneutic study. I've had kind of fun doing the hermeneutic study. Got some good feedback from that as well. Uh, so I uh, hope, uh, hope you're with us uh, all through the week. And next week, um, one of those days, I'm going to pack up and go to Branson. We're already working feverishly to get everything ready. And uh, let's see, had someone sign up yesterday, so it's still not too late. We've got, I I don't, I didn't go back to all the records, uh, but uh, this might be the largest ever. We got a a good one coming up in the Book of Romans, so uh, come join us if you can in Branson. Uh, You can go on the, uh, on randywhiteministries.org, look for the trips button and find Branson there, and then you can uh, sign up for that or send me an email, randy at randywhiteministries.org. And uh, very much looking forward to seeing so many of you there. Hey, yesterday I mentioned about Israel, and that'll be uh, in early February, maybe January 31st for a departure. But uh, let's see. I noticed uh, Valerie had a question here. Glad to hear Israel has rid all covenant, all COVID requirements. By the way, they were... Uh, uh, right at the top of the list, very, very strict in COVID requirements, COVID passports, every kind of thing uh, that you could uh, think of. And I really thought for a time, boy, I'll never be going back to Israel uh, because of all the requirements that they have. But they dropped them totally. Kind of like even even sort of the CDC right now is just sort of saying, ha, never mind. <laughs> boy, that was fun. Fauci's like, out of here which is a good thing. But anyway, uh, the question is, will the U.S. require a test to return? Now the United States also does not require anything. You can get in, you can leave without a test, you can get in without a test, you can leave without a vaccine, you can get in without a vaccine, all as it should have been all along. But... um, uh, anyway, all 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 things are uh, are dropped, and uh, let me just say for me, and you all do whatever you want to do, obviously. But uh, I'll be happy to give you my opinion on it if you want it. But for me, I'm not going to get a vaccine, and I'm not going to get a test. So that would that would be a non-starter for me to uh, go to Israel, uh, and uh, so you know. I was kind of thinking through all this, like, "Ah, if I've been to Israel before, I'd love to go to Israel again. It's fascinating, and I love teaching in Israel, but I'm not going to get a shot to do it, and I'm not going to take a test to do it. Uh, So those of you who haven't been, do it it now while, while, while you got your health. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, while there's no uh, regulations there, I mean, who knows when all that'll change and that'll, uh, that, that'll be cut off or whatever government overreach it may be at the time. We live in an age of government overreach until something comes along to change that. And something probably will, either the rapture or, uh, you know, government's ebb and flow. And uh, let's uh, pray that our votes and our activism can flow it towards less government overreach. Um, okay, that was a incidental question. I wanted to get uh, started on that. So we're going to do a TV program here or record a television program here in a moment. I want to start, uh, let's see, I want to start from a question from Ryan, a young Marine um, in that. And I've got a, que- a question from Ives. I've got a question from uh, Eric, a question from Robert. Um, and... Um, a uh, question uh, from Chuck, a question from Barney, a uh, question from Rich, a question from Randy and R- Manny and Rudy and Stephanie. Let's just go through them. We'll, 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 we'll try to get all of them in today. Uh, and uh, I will now start the recording for the television program, and uh, we will uh, make a good go of it. By the way, happy birthday, Mom. Today's her uh, birthday down in Katy, Texas, and... Uh, Wish you the best. Uh, now, let's take 23 and a half minutes, 28 and a half minutes, and uh, record this. If you don't know the drill, 
it's all live. It's the same thing. It just makes it clean so that uh, when Nathan sends it off to the television station, it doesn't have to do a whole lot of work to uh, make it ready to go. And uh, we uh, still receive your questions during this. Uh, and uh, I think the easiest place to do it is just go to askthetheologian.com and put that submit a question button. But you can do it right where you are in Worshify. Just uh, use the uh, question button there in Randy White Ministries, the same. And in uh, uh, YouTube, if you'll just uh, include the word question. Uh, at the beginning. That'll certainly help us. Okay, I'll be back in 15 seconds. When we end in 28 and a half minutes, we're not done. Stay tuned. See you in just a moment. And good morning to you. This is Randy White, and you're watching Ask the Theologian, where we take biblical, theological, and worldview questions. And we don't just take the standard answer. We rightly divide the word of truth, and we question the assumptions all along the way. I think we'll have a good time here today. Uh, I hope it'll be entertaining. I hope it'll be informative. I hope it'll be true to the word of God. And if it's not, call me out on it. How's that sound? Let's uh, start today with Ryan in the United States Marines. Ryan says, I've been a Christian since I was 19. I'm 23 now. I always, always uh, was a believer uh, in, uh, in the things of the Word and in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, ever since I was a kid, but it took, took me getting wrapped up in some trouble to actually know what it means to be a Christian and believing in Jesus Christ. I joined the Marine Corps two years ago. Let's stop and say, God bless you, young man. We appreciate uh, men like you. I joined the Marine Corps two years ago and just kind of lost my way. And I'm going back to some old ways. What steps should I take to get on track back with God and with fellowship and where the Holy Spirit's really making an impact on my life again? I really feel convicted. And Ryan, we appreciate uh, not only your service, but as a young man, a desire to live a life that is, uh, uh, is honorable to the Lord and to be on track with God and fellowship, as you uh, mentioned in your question. Let me say a couple of things. Uh, one is, uh, don't, don't blame any of your struggles on being a Marine. Uh, you know, you might say, oh boy, what a difficult place it is because I'm a Marine. I'm surrounded by all these young men and, uh, you know, young men, uh, give them a, give them a few minutes and they'll find a way to stir up some sin. And if I just wasn't a Marine, nah, that's not the issue. You got into trouble before you were a Marine. You got into trouble as a Marine. You may get into trouble after you, after you're uh, done with your Marine service. So it has nothing to do with being a Marine, first of all. Uh, and, uh, then I, I would really say, uh, uh, even 23-year-old men who are not involved in the Marines sometimes find themselves, as you say here, just kind of lost my way. Now, that the, the, the truth is, even 53-year-old men or 58-year-old men or 73-year-old men, they, we kind of lose our way. It's a thing of, well, it's a thing of humanity, not just men. So what, I, what I'm saying to you here is the struggles that you have are, this won't be encouraging, but they are lifelong struggles. I wish I could say, yeah, every 23-year-old Marine has this, but by the time you're a 33-year-old, uh, you know, maybe a, a young dad and careerman, uh, then you won't have any of those problems. Huh, but that would be a lie. Now, you want to know what steps you should take to, uh, to, to get back on track with God and with fellowship with Him. Enjoy that uh, walk that you would want. I'm, I'm going to give a, a, um, a contrarian answer here. Now, the old Baptist preacher in me, that's pretty much gone, but the old Baptist preacher in me would say, well, young man, you need to get down to church. You need to, uh, you need to start reading your Bible every day. You need to have a quiet time. You need to uh, you know, hang around with uh, uh, Christian people, and you need to, uh, you know, whatever it is. Uh, all, all of that list of the church stuff that you need to do. And much of that may be a big blessing to you, maybe a curse to you, because there are so many churches out there that honestly, uh, as, as a young man and a Marine, you've got a brain and you've got uh, intellect and you've got desire and you've got strength and you've got will. All the things that you don't find too much in church today, sadly, 
And so many times, this would not be exclusively the case. Obviously, there would be exceptions. But many times, you'll go down to the local church and sit there, and they'll be given these sweet little Jesus is my boyfriend kind of uh, songs and, uh, and and warm, fuzzy kind of sermons. And you're going to walk out of there saying, I'm trying to have a relationship with God and trying to make life meaningful. And what is this stuff? Or you'll go down uh, to the local church, and it'll be, man, see at the top. Ah, yeah, we can do it. And hey, you're thinking, well, the drill sergeant puts that into me. I can... I, you know, I can, I can, I can run race. I can get to the top of the hill. I can do all that. I don't need this in the church. And, and, and others might be saying, oh, but man, you, you, the only way you're going to have any kind of fellowship with good people is in the church. And you're thinking, I got fellowship with good guys right where I am. I don't need the church for that. And you are right. You are absolutely right. So what I would say is you're going to have to to take the take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and you're going to have to uh, develop your own plan for a healthy relationship with the Lord. I think that it does involve learning the content of Scripture. I would give this advice to any 23-year-old. Learn what the Scripture actually says. Hopefully, there's a local church that will help you to do that, but I am, I, I'm, I'm, not ho- I'm, I'm not all that hopeful, really, uh, uh, because I've seen what's out there in local churches. So you probably have to, first of all, you could do it completely on your own. You could uh, just say, I'm going to start with Genesis, and I'm going to go all the way through the book of Revelation, and I'm going to go, I don't know, maybe chapter by chapter. And at the end of each chapter, I'm going to see if I can pass a Bible quiz on this. Uh, and, uh, you know, at one time I had, I have, I have not progressed on this, but I had the goal. Uh, I was going to write a quiz on every chapter of the Bible. Well, write your own quiz. I don't have the quiz to give you, but write your own quiz. And, and do it on the content of the Bible. If you can spend your 20s becoming an expert on Bible content, then what a world of difference that is going to make. And here's one of the reasons why. You are going then to hear sermons. You might hear them on the radio. You might hear them on the internet. You might hear them down at the local church. And you are immediately, if you're an expert in Bible content, you're immediately going to know, is he using that in context? Is he using that properly? Is he using that to try to abuse me? Is he using that in a manipulative kind of way? Because I don't get abused and I don't get manipulated. I I am my own man and I am going to take it. So learn the content of the Bible is what I would say to you. And then especially learn, as we talk about here with my rotating mug, learn to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, that means figuring out what's for Ryan and what's not for Ryan, because there's a lot of stuff in the Bible here that's not for Ryan. You need to know it, and I want you to know it, but there's a lot of stuff in there that's not for you, a lot of stuff that's for Israel, a lot of stuff that's for uh, men and women who are living under the law, and you're not living under the law, a lot of stuff that doesn't have anything to do with the body of Christ, and you are in the body of Christ. Uh, And so being able to separate that out, a lot of the stuff that was for the future and you're not living in the future, a lot of stuff that was for the past and you're not living in the past, don't take the idea that everywhere I look in the Bible, there's going to be some warm, fuzzy application that I'm going to to, uh, be able to take uh, home with me. So what I'm saying is your relationship with God will be strengthened by a focus on content and then a minor focus on what applies to me that I need to integrate into my daily life. Now, I think if you go with, uh, again, sort of a standard evangelical answer, you will, you'll be trying to live a Christian life that is going to be based upon emotion. And I don't think you need to do that. I think if you try to live a Christian life that's based upon emotion, and emotion, you know, it's that kind of thing. uh, It's, uh, you know, how do I feel about my Christian life today? Uh, You know, I'll just be blunt. You're a Marine. I think you can take it. I don't care how you feel about your Christian life today. You know, it's not worth a warm bucket of spit, honestly, how you care about your your, uh, Christian life. What matters is... Do you have a Christian life? I think you do because you have talked about belief here and you know that uh, the Christian life is by grace, through faith, not of works. Now, uh, having a Christian life, I, as a pastor, I'm kind of interested in, uh, well, what's shaping your thinking? 
I want the word of God to shape your thinking. I want the word of God rightly divided to shape your thinking. And I want you to take the long look. I want you to say, you know, when I'm in my 50s, I really want to be a good, solid Bible expert. Whatever it is I do, you know, maybe I'll be uh, uh, high up in the Marines by then, or maybe I'll be out of the Marines and have a career. Or, you know, what it, whatever it is I do, I still want to be a good expert at the Bible and knowing the Word of God. So I would say aim for, aim for content, content in your mind your mind will lead your heart along. Your heart will try to flutter out there every now and then. Who cares? Uh, but but uh, get your mind right. And that is going to help in so many things. And the, the sadly, out there in the Christian world, it has, it has said, Ryan, you are not in a right relationship with God if you don't just feel, mm, mm, yeah a closeness. Well, uh, forget about the closeness. And uh, let's go here with what do you know? Now, what you know obviously is going to change behavior and you're going to come along somewhere along the way and you're going to think about grace and you're going to think about what God has offered. And you might say, you know, I've got some things in my life that really I wouldn't want to sit down and talk to God with face to face. And especially in light of the grace that he's given to me. And so I'm going to work on getting rid of those. I got some bad habits. I've got some bad behaviors, whatever it is. Uh, I'm going to work on getting rid of those because I, I, I want, I, I want to be able to sit down with my Lord Jesus Christ someday and say, man, you know, I messed up, but you forgave me. I messed up again and again and again, and you forgave me and you know, all that kind of stuff. But, but, uh, Lord, I, I am so grateful for what you have done for me. And I, I, I did everything I could do. Back, you know, I was messed up when I was 22 years old, 23 years old. But man, did I start learning the word of God and start coming along. God bless you. We need more young men like you. Uh, thanks, Ryan, for that uh, good question. And let's go now to San Fernando, Pampanga, the Philippines. Ives has a question today. It's a very practical question. Uh, it says, uh, I, I'm currently a member of a fundamental Baptist church. Let me just say, by the way, I think that uh, uh, independent fundamentalist churches uh, are, are probably the best hope you're going to get in our world today, whether it's Baptist or whatever kind of independent fundamental church it is. I am not interested, and some of you are, and I used to be. I lived that life. I'm not interested in denominationalism at all. I think there are there, there's too much baggage with denominationalism. Uh, I don't know of a single denomination, bar none, that I would be interested in, in uh, being involved in. I couldn't uh, accept their, uh, their documents. I couldn't accept their activities. I couldn't accept the pressures that they give, the manipulation they give, on and on. I'm just not interested in that. I think independence is the way to go, and I think fundamentalist is the way to go. I've written a little booklet called Why I'm a Fundamentalist, and You Should Be Too. As a matter of fact, got a little special. If any of you would like that book, you can send me an email, randy at randywhiteministries.org, and, uh, and I'll, I'll just send you a, a free copy, Why I'm a Fundamentalist, and You Should Be Too. And, and it, might, uh, it might change the idea that some of you evangelicals have towards fundamentalism, because I think there are a lot of evangelicals call themselves evangelicals, and they're actually fundamentalists. And they're scared to call themselves fundamentalists, but they, they don't need to be. And so I'll do that. And for those of you like Ives who live uh, outside of the United States, I'll uh, send you a PDF. But if you live in the United States, I'll give you a uh, copy. And, and incidentally, speaking of, uh, uh, of, of uh, independent fundamental church, he says, I'm a, I'm a member of, I'll get to the question a moment ago. I I like to read a lot of old stuff by independent fundamentalist Baptists. I, I've just been picking this book up, The, Ki the Coming Kingdom of Christ by John R. Rice. Uh, uh, John R. Rice was a, a very uh, solid independent fundamentalist Baptist preacher. 
And uh, I, I am very interested in the kingdom of Christ because I believe that there is no kingdom right now. The kingdom has been postponed and the kingdom will be future. I am in, I'm interested in this because I believe there was a gospel of the kingdom that is not preached today and should not be preached today. So I went to this 1945 book right here and I said, well, I want to see what John R. Rice says. And guess what? He belie- he agrees with me. He says the same thing that I do. Uh, and uh, so there's, there's so much good in that he might not rightly divide exactly like I rightly divide, but man, he's within a hair's breadth of being right there. Now, all of that background, let's get to the question here. He says, uh, I says I'm a member of a fundamental Baptist church, although I don't want to sound uh, supercilious. Supercilious. I like your word there. <laughs> I have a feeling that I'm the only person clo- close to rightly dividing there. I'll stop right there. So, you're probably right. Uh, And uh, anyone who rightly divides, and that is you separate that which is for Israel from that which is for us. Anyone who does that is very much in the minority in almost any church. There are a few right dividing churches like mine and uh, they, you know, we kind of wear it on the sleeve. It's out there. You know, everybody, everybody knows it. And you would, after a time, you would be a minority there. But, but there aren't many right divide, dividing churches around. And so if you're going to go to a church in most places, including San Fernando, Pampanga, you're going to be in the minority. Maybe you'll be the only representative of that. And many of our listeners, of course, know exactly what that is. So we go further. My question is, how much involvement in ministry should I have in this non-rightly dividing assembly? For instance, my former choir director wants me to join the choir again. Choir singing has a special place in my heart, but one of the things that hinders me from joining is that there's some music, uh, some music pieces that uh, just don't sound right on the lyrics and can only be applied to God's Israel. Would you advise me not to join it, or should I just ignore the lyrics and just consider it like reading the rest of the Bible, just read it and don't apply it? Uh, sing it, but don't apply it. And from uh, the Philippines, he says, Salamat, and Salamat to you as well. Now, uh, this is a great dilemma for right dividers because, again, uh, by and large, their churches are not right dividing churches. I would say, if you've got a church that preaches the gospel correctly, and that is that they preach a gospel of grace, uh, even if... I, I'm even okay if their wording is not not quite like I would like it to be, but they do understand that baptism doesn't save, church membership doesn't save, uh, you know, tithing doesn't save, all of that kind of stuff. So they they get the gospel right, uh, and, and if some of the the terminology is different, and I say this because uh, you know I led a lot of people to Christ over the years, and which. Uh, I would, I would listen to myself now and say, oh, I wish you hadn't have said it that way. Uh, but I did say it that way, and I believe they came to Christ, and they, they, they know Christ, and they love Christ, and they're growing in Christ today. And that would be my own personal experience and the personal experience of so many in our audience. Now, they get the gospel right. If their terminology is a little right, wrong, we can fix that. We can have a discussion. We can talk through it over time. That's all good. Uh, So uh, do they put you under any kind of the law, under any kind of legalism in order to have a a good fellowship with them? Are you going to be put on the the naughty boys list down at the church bulletin board says, hey, watch out for this guy because he doesn't uh, abide by this uh, Torah legislation that we have somehow adopted and passed into the church. If you are free from legalism and you are free from uh, a works-based gospel and the pastor and the ministries of that church are pretty consistent at teaching the word of God for its content, as we talked about with Ryan, and 
so it's not just a warm, fuzzy sermon. It's not just a, um, uh, a um, uh, you know, go get him tiger sermon. But there really is some biblical content there. Then I would say, for me, I'm comfortable overlooking a lot of that stuff. I it, 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 let me let me tell you, even for our church, uh, I have almost given up on always having music that rightly divides. And, and here's the reason. I. I'll just be blunt. That's a tiny church. I call ourselves America's greatest tiny church. I pick the music. Well, I got 10,000 other things to do. I don't have a lot of time to pick the music. And to go through the words and get them all right and, you know, on and on. I I could, you you could spend hours and hours and hours, days and days trying to get all that right. Uh, And so, you know, I take up the hymnal and I say, I like that song. And then sometimes I look at it and say, oh, can we skip verse two? (laughs) Because verse two, man, that's messed up. And we'll skip a verse or something like that. Uh, But sometimes even we'll just, we'll just sing it. I, I can't remember the last time we sang that song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, but it's it's not really the best. It's it's kind of a post millennial song. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. He soldiers of the cross lift high his royal banner. It must not not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his his um, um, uh, talks about the defeating of the enemies. Anyway, uh, till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. It's post millennial. We've probably sung it in our church. And, you know, I have to reinterpret it in my mind. As the pastor, of course, I can stop and I can say, now, you and I, you know, are fighting for Jesus. We're not going to defeat the enemy. He is going to come. But let's take the sense of the song and the joy of the song and let's, let's sing it together. So I, I, I let a lot of things slide. I think most right dividers in a in a in a, any church other than those who have been long time established right dividing churches, and let me say long time established right dividing churches, they don't do a lot of music. They uh, they they are very minimalistic in music, and I think it's it's for this very reason. There's just not a lot of right dividing stuff there, and. Uh, you know, there's we, we don't have time to write a new song or write a new verse to the song. So my advice, again, with, with some of those uh, disclaimers is join the choir. You enjoy, join, you enjoy singing the choir. You'll be a blessing in the choir. You'll be an encouragement in the choir. Uh, and hopefully it is such a situation in your church. I don't know the culture of the Philippines, obviously, but it's a, a culture in your church where you can uh, at least say to your buddy next to you, I, I take this verse a little bit differently. You know, afterwards, want to go down and get a hamburger? That's what we would do in, you know, where I live. You want to go down and get a hamburger? Green chili cheeseburger? When I was in Texas, I would have said, you want to go down and get a Whataburger afterwards and uh, talk about it? So if it's the kind of openness where you're not going to be kicked out because you raise your hand or you question something, I would go for it personally. And part of the reason is you're not going to find anything else. You know, if if there was a dozen right dividing churches out there, I'd say go join the choir at one of those or start a choir at one of those. Uh, Or if you could just go out and, uh, you know, uh, uh, put in the local paper, you know, uh, the Salamat right dividing church. And uh, you'd get 15 or 20 people come and be a part of it. uh, And uh, you could uh, use some other resources. You could be the pastor. Then I'd say go for that. But that's not often the case. Now, let me also say to this, and I know I've spent a lot of time on this, but let me also say to this that uh, a lot of you are listening and you're saying, hey, bald-headed preacher in Taos, New Mexico, you don't understand my town. Every church has so messed up the gospel and has, or has so put under legalism that, you know, I just, I, I, I stayed, I stayed until I bit my tongue all the way off and then I had to leave. 
And I understand that to be the case, that there are a lot of places where there really is not even sort of this good compromise that uh, I'm envisioning with uh, Ives as it uh, comes through there. Thanks for a, uh, a good and a uh, practical question that uh, comes about there. And um, let's see, Eric uh, uh, up in Oslo, Minnesota asked the question, why did David bring five stones from the book, uh, from the brook, excuse me, to fight Goliath? <laughs> was it because he was a bad shot? <laughs> why five stones? Now, let me say, and I've said this a number of times on this program, that uh, why questions are the hardest one to answer. Because especially in the scripture, usually the why isn't answered. All we know is the content of five stones. I think that, that there, there, there's, a, there's a tension that we've got here. Number one is it could be, um, oh, shall we say, uh, 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 open a, a door wide open to creating make-believe to spiritualizing this. You know what you do when you spiritualize is you make spiritual lies. And it certainly could be one of these uh, things where we could say, well, he took five smooth stones because one, there was the profession of faith in Christ. And two, there was, uh, uh, there was the uh, walking down the aisle. And three, there was, you know, you can make up all sorts of just absolutely dumb stuff. And and and, and that, that comes when we try to uh, put things in the Bible that aren't there. So there's one danger. But the other danger is the other extreme and say, he took five stones because it says he took five stones. That's, that's it. He took five stones. He used one of them. That's why. Well, I'm, I'm kind of one that says, I'd, I'm curious. I'm one that says, I've, I've talked about this even recently, that says, I think we ought to ask questions of the text. So he took five smooth stones. Well, why did he take five smooth stones? Why didn't he take, you know, four rough stones? What? And, and to consider all of the various possibilities that could be to search the scriptures to see if there's anything there. Now, I don't know that I have uh, much to go with. I, I don't think that it was because he was a bad shot. I, uh, I, I suspect that David was amazing with a slingshot. I just suspect. I suspect, I don't think he was that old at this time. I don't know exactly uh, his age, but, uh, you know, a teenager, maybe an upper teenager. Uh, But I suspect you and I, if we uh, looked at uh, David and saw him in action, we would be utterly amazed and we would probably be saying, get that kid in the Olympics. Uh, so, so here is a, a kid with, uh, with athletic prowess, I, I suspect. That's, that's the way I see it in the scripture anyway. Uh, now, so why was it? So I'm going to kind of put that, that aside, bad shot. Uh, it's kind of humorous though. Uh, I am going to put that one aside and say, okay, it's probably not because it was a bad shot. When you look into the scripture, you do find some significance with the number five. Five is actually always this this number of grace. And so could it be just subtly saying, hey, God's grace is about to be seen? It's it's possible. And that's about as far as I probably would want to go with it, but it's it, it, it's possible. And uh, the first the first stone, by the way, the one that killed him, one, is always a singular testimony that puts it out. Could it be there's five, there's grace, but there's one, and that uh, God's grace is going to be a full expression, God's sovereignty over Goliath and over the Philistines is going to be put there? Possibly. If I were preaching a sermon, I wouldn't mind putting some of those ideas out. I would always want to say, eh, you know you can take this or leave it. I used to say, this is free stuff here. Uh, you, you can take it or leave it. Uh, but inquiring minds want to know, don't they? Ask the questions and then don't build a doctrine on it. How's that sound? I'm out of time for this television program. We have a full hour at randywhitministries.org and you can submit your questions 24 hours a day, seven days a week at askthetheologian.com. And uh, thank you, uh, Eric, for that uh, good question. 
By the way, I've got, hmm. I can't really get over there and get to it. Uh, because if I got up, you would see that I'm wearing shorts. <laughs> um, but I, I, I keep a, uh, one of those uh, smooth stones from the brook sort of on my desk. It's right over across the way over there. But anyway, I'll show it to you someday. Um, let's, um, let's, I, I, I'm, tr I'm trying to get more television programs uh, stocked up for when I'm out of town at Branson. So let's do another television program. We'll start with uh, Robert's question. And uh, I am going, before we take that uh, question, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a, uh, it's a question about the uh, sinner's prayer. Um, and I'm going to see if we can pull up a, uh, an example of it uh, here. Not surprised that uh, got questions comes up first. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take uh, that one and um, see... See if I can uh, find find a real good one here to uh, to bring up. Um, yeah. Okay. Here's one. Uh, got it. Okay. Now I'm all ready to go for Robert and Holly Springs. Um, so let's do another television program uh, and uh, see if we can squeeze in a bunch more questions and. Uh, get uh, get that all on the road. Uh, here we go. Uh, I'll be back in about 15 seconds. You just stay tuned. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Ask the Theologian. I'm Dr. Randy White, and we take your biblical, theological, and worldview questions, give them a right divided answer, and we question the assumptions, and uh, we, uh, we, we don't take the standard evangelical answer because I'm the author of Evangelical Garbage, available at dispensationalpublishing.com or other places that you buy books. And uh, we want to get right into questions today. Let's uh, start with Robert from Holly Springs, Mississippi. Mississippi, says, have you ever addressed the subject of the sinner's prayer, such as the one used by Franklin Graham? What's your take? Okay, this sinner's prayer. It's a pretty common thing. Have I ever addressed it? Probably so, but it's been a long time. Let's do it again. We've got uh, uh, 3,800 questions or so at askthetheologian.com. Let's add one to it here on the sinner's prayer. Very, very, very common among evangelicals to share maybe the four spiritual laws or steps to peace with God or whatever the gospel tract is and conclude that in the sinner's prayer. My own little gospel tract, which I do not have a, a copy of right here on my uh, desk, but I'll be happy to send you a, a free copy of it. Just send me an email, randy at randywhiteministries.org. Uh, and ask for uh, the essential gospel tract. And I've got, I've got four steps in there also. And then I've got a fifth that uh, talks about, okay, what do I do now? What, what, what do I do having received a gift that God is offering to me? What do I do? You know, I say in there something like, well, some people say a prayer, but you don't have to say a prayer. Some people join a church, but you don't have to join a church and talk about some of the things that are, uh, that, that are kind of typical follow-ups in uh, this issue. Now, I think the problem with the sinner's prayer is it, it really is given. It's not meant, I think if you pressed it, and, and if you read some articles on it, probably you would even say, they don't mean to make it a, this is how you get saved by saying the prayer, but that's the way it's uh, presented and it comes across. But really, I think the problem is in the prayer itself, it's, uh, you know, often... 
written out ahead of time. Hey, why don't you say this prayer? Or, you know, you can say a prayer, but be sure you include these things. And uh, let's, let's look at a couple. Here's one uh, that uh, I pull up on the internet by Dr. Ray Pritchard. I am not familiar with Ray Pritchard, but it says, uh, Lord Jesus, for too long I've kept you out of my life. I know that I'm a sinner and that I cannot save myself. No longer will I close the door when I hear you knocking. By faith, I gratefully receive your gift of salvation. I am ready to trust you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to earth. I believe you are the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead the third day. Thank you for bearing my sins and uh, giving me the gift of eternal life. I believe your words are true. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and be my Savior. Amen. Now, that's I would say it's probably a better version of the sinner's prayer than many of them, but... The, one of the reasons I think it's a better version is it, it, is it does two things. One, it includes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Two, it includes on a number of occasions this uh, issue of, um, uh, of grace that uh, the Lord has uh, borne our sins upon the cross, has a gift of eternal life that is given. Not a lot of works-based, not a lot of, uh, uh, you know, boy, I repent of uh, all of the bad things that I've done, and I promise never to do these things again. Not a lot of that works in there. It's a little right at the beginning of that uh, particular prayer, but not a lot of it uh, uh, in there. And uh, so, you know, decent, but, you know, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and be my savior. Uh, Things like this are uh, not really a biblical way of stating that I I receive your gift. And, And furthermore, do we have to open our mouth to receive the gift? Do we have to say a prayer? Isn't it faith? Place my faith in Jesus Christ. Whether or not I said it in a prayer, whether or not I verbalized it, I place my faith in Jesus Christ, and uh, there it is. Uh, here we'll go. Let's uh, look at this uh, one just a little bit from gotquestions.org. I am not a fan of Got Questions. I think that uh, for the most part, you just get a standard infant pablum from them, standard evangelical garbage. There we go. Standard evangelical garbage is what you get from God questions. But let's see what uh, they have to say. Uh, The sinner's prayer is a prayer a person prays to God when they understand that they are a sinner and need a savior. Even even you go right there. They understand they're a sinner and need a savior. So they don't have they don't have a savior yet. Saying a sinner's prayer will not accomplish anything on its own. That always is, uh, uh, you know, a little footnote that's given. A true sinner's prayer only represents what a person knows, understands, and believes about their sinfulness to salvation. Now, okay, uh, maybe maybe it does, but. Do I need to represent it? Is there some uh, biblical requirement that somehow I represent what I uh, believe? I don't know that there is. You know, uh, know, uh, what must I do to be saved? Well, you must place your faith and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and represent that through a sinner's prayer. I don't need to represent it in any way. You go on, it's got a little video there. The first aspect of a sinner's prayer is understanding that we are all sinners. Now, there I have a little bit of a disagreement because the problem is not really my sin. We are all sinners, but the problem is not my sin. The problem is I'm separated from God. I'm separated from God. Even if I didn't sin, I'm separated from God. And so the problem is I need a savior, not that I am a sinner. Let's go on. Uh, The second aspect of the sinner's prayer is knowing what God has done to remedy our lost and sinful condition. Okay, that's certainly an aspect of belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, but again, does it have to be a part of any kind of prayer that's that's, uh, given? And then the article goes on to say, saying the sinner's prayer is simply a way of declaring to God that you are relying on Jesus Christ, your Savior. There are no magical words that result in salvation. It is only faith in Jesus Christ, death and resurrection that can save us if you understand that you are a sinner and need salvation through Jesus Christ. Here's a sinner's prayer that you can pray unto God. Okay, let's uh, see if we can uh, enlarge this uh, just a little bit. And uh, here it is. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that 
that I deserve the consequences of my sin. However, I'm trusting in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I believe that his death and resurrection provided for my forgiveness. I trust in Jesus and Jesus alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and forgiving me. Amen. Very similar to that of Dr. Ray Pritchard that we read uh, just a little bit ago. Uh, you know, I think one of the biggest problems with a sinner's prayer is it gives the implication that you've got to do something. Even though we say, now it's not these words, now it's not this action, now it's not this. Are you ready? Are you ready? But it's not what you're going to say. Are you ready? And we speak kind of with forked tongue on it. And it's a natural to bring it about. In the scripture, you, I, I don't, that I know of, I'm a pretty good biblical expert. You don't see any example of a sinner's prayer. So why don't why don't we just take it and uh, say, okay, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm asking you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Mankind is separated from God. Man needs a savior. God sent a savior. He's offering salvation now by grace through faith, not of works to anyone who would receive it. Would you all, would, would you receive it? You don't even have to give me a nod. You don't even have to go, uh, uh yeah, uh-huh. Nothing. You can just receive it. It's, it's grace. And, and, and so in the sinner's prayer thing, we almost immediately add, here's things you have to now do. Because I promise you after the sinner's prayer, the next tract or the next paragraph is now all who God called he called publicly time for you to get down to the local church start telling your mother and your father and your friends and your neighbors and uh, down at the church you got to walk the aisle oh then you got to be baptized oh then you got to uh, you know start going to Sunday school then you got to start tithing then you got to and and uh, we started off on a uh, on a, a works basis, that is, my mouth has to be moving, or my hands have to be moving, or my foot has to be moving in order to, to, to really be an obedient Christian. You said the sinner's prayer. That didn't save you. you. Are you ready to say it? Didn't save you. It's not the words you said. Now, the first step of obedience is you've got to be baptized. And, and we create this scenario of works in it. So, you know, is it inherently wrong for a person to, to say a prayer when they place their faith in Jesus Christ? Even to declare to Jesus Christ that they place their faith in him? No, I don't think that would be inherently wrong. In fact, I think in many ways it would be kind of natural. But uh, the, way, the way it's presented, I think, leaves it into a works thing. I think if we want to share the gospel and grace, we, you know, if, if I'm witnessing to a person, I share, you know, here's this gift, gone through a, a presentation, here's this gift that God offers, and uh, what you have to do is uh, uh, place your faith uh, in him, and uh, isn't that wonderful? Period. It, I'm not even sure that we have to say, now, are you ready? It might be natural. We might want to, but I don't, I don't think we have to. And, and so many things that we can do to leave it there with them. And they may want to shout and jump the pew and say, hallelujah, guess what I just did? And they may want to shout it, sing it, pray it, you know, advertise it on a blimp, whatever. Good for them. Or they may be a very private person and just say, yeah, um, thanks for sharing that. Well, good. We, we can do that. And then they can begin to live a life of grace. Thanks, uh, Robert, for the question from Holly Springs, Mississippi. I appreciate uh, that. Uh, let's go to Barney up in Iowa. Barney happens to be a pastor and uh, says in Romans chapter 8, verse 23, who are they and who are ourselves? He says, I'm putting together a study on adoption and grafted in. And at one time I thought I knew who it was, but now I'm questioning everything. Isn't, isn't, it, a, uh, isn't it kind of a blessing to uh, be there? Where you, where you start questioning what you thought you always knew. Uh, again, uh, you know, we have this mug right here that says, question the assumptions. Uh, 
And uh, I learned so much when I, when I began to question what I already knew. I learned not to be a parrot. I learned to get over my indoctrination. Romans chapter 8 verse 23 says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Waiting for the adoption. Whoever they and, and ourselves. Now, This is the question. Who are they and ourselves? By the way, I believe we ought to be persnickety about pronouns. Well, who is they and who is ourselves? And is ourselves Barney and Randy or is that someone else? Uh, let Let the scripture speak on that. And rather than reading into it, makes a world of difference. But one of the things we want to uh, look at and figure out here, to try to do this, we can look at some cross-references, for example, and uh, waiting for the adoption. Now, now that all this is done, they and ourselves are waiting uh, for the adoption. Now, waiting for the adoption. If we uh, look, I don't know, uh, uh, where, where would it be? Romans... Uh, Romans, uh, I don't have the cross-reference right there. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 6, perhaps, you know, uh, chapter 3, perhaps, maybe it's chapter 3, verse 1, talks about, uh, you know, what advantage hath a Jew? Ah, great in every way. And, and, it, and it speaks about some of the advantages, and it says, to them belong the adoption. Now, if the adoption is for them, is there anything in the Scripture that gives it to us? I think you've got good reason to question the assumptions on this. By the way, uh, many of you know that I am uh, working on uh, what soon will be our Labor Day Bible Conference and Retreat in Branson, Missouri, and we will be uh, studying the book of Romans. I just happened to pull up Romans 8, 1 1 through 39, my little uh, chart on this. And I call Romans 8, 1 through 39, the struggle and survival of God's elect. And we're looking at verse 23. That comes in this section of 18 through 25, which is the future glory of Israel. And uh, by the way, what is that uh, future glory of Israel? You could probably look at verse 23. Uh, We groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption. To wit, that means that means the redemption of our body, our singular body, Israel. Now, I think we're talking about they. We would want to check the contents the text here, but they is uh, Israel, the forefathers, and we ourselves is Israel at the present day of Paul, including Paul, who of course is a Jew. And uh, would put it that uh, that way. I think when we do that, it, it's sort of frustrating sometimes because it takes away something we thought was ours. But man, it it liberates us from a lot of confusion when we get it right. And uh, again, I think you are uh, exactly right to take uh, to question anyway whether or not Romans 8, 1 through 39, as we have it here in the forthcoming book on uh, Romans Graphically Presented, should be the struggle and survival of God's elect. And verses 18 through 25, the future glory of Israel. Thanks, Barney. I hope that uh, is uh, helpful in uh, the uh, journey that you're going on. Let's go and rich to uh, Rich in Polka, West Virginia, who's got a, uh, a, a biblical question about uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Let's just read it on the right corner of your screen, upper right corner. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. It is this little phrase right here that uh, we are looking at. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So, Rich has uh, a question. He says, a literal reading seems to imply that Adam should have died on that day and not just been separated from God. 
Is it a textual language issue that we don't have in English? Uh, I, I, I don't see anything to take it allegorically like you know, the day you eat of it, you're spiritually going to die. This is what uh, Christianity does and a lot of evangelical garbage is built into things like this, that they take a passage of scripture, which does seem to be pretty plain, and yet in our experience didn't seem to happen the way the plain sense is, And so they create an allegorical or a spiritual sense. Now, I believe in one of the golden rules of interpretation is if the plain sense makes common sense, seek no other sense. Or you'll make up nonsense. Here, just in reading it in English, the plain sense doesn't make a little, doesn't make common sense because this is chapter 2, verse 17. And we read about Adam, say in chapter four, he's having kids and it goes on, you know, and he, he lives 900 and some odd years, years old. Well, that doesn't seem like the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So, so what's up with that? The plain sense doesn't make common sense. So then we have to be careful to make sure that which we're dreaming up isn't nonsense. What we, Christendom, have dreamed up is you'll be spiritually separated from God. It is a spiritual death that it's talking about. I, I don't like an allegorical reading of Scripture, and especially in Genesis 1 and 2, where taking it literally is so very important to how you understand the rest of the Scripture. And, and there's, there's just nothing here that sort of hints, hey, figurative speech, spiritual speech, allegorical speech. There's nothing that hints of it. So what is it? Well, we come back and uh, we look, and uh, uh, Rich certainly uh, mentioned this in the uh, question. Right, if, if you've got a good uh, King James Bible, they have this little symbol right here. It looks like a little, uh, little cross, if you will. Uh, that means a translator note. And that particular symbol, there's three kinds of translator's notes in the uh, King James. Another one is, uh, if we jump down here to verse 19, by the way, this, uh, these two parallel lines. Parallel lines typically mean there's two ways you can take this. We put it this way, or you could take it this way. It's, it's over in a marginal note. Uh, the second is this little cross-looking thing, which typically is used to, to share a more literal translation. So looking at a more literal translation, let's see what it says. Therefore, thou shalt surely die. And we pull up that little translator note, and it says, Hebrew, dying, thou shalt die. Okay, what does that mean? Dying, thou shalt die. It's not not really a good good English phrase, but but that's the literal Hebrew. So let's, let's take it this way, going back to the verse here. In the day that thou eatest thereof, dying, thou shalt die. Ah, maybe it doesn't say you will die that day, but it does say dying sets in and you're going to die. The day that thou eatest thereof, dying, thou shalt die the process of death begins. The process of death, we're all in it, I hate to tell you, but the process of death is kind of a slow process. And, and uh, if you've got all the right circumstances, we can, we can slow it down. Adam lived uh, pre-flood. He lived in a place uh, where uh, there was not a lot of, um, uh, let's just say the second law of thermodynamics had not uh, expressed itself for very long. And so there was not a lot of breakdown of uh, the gene pool. There was not a lot of uh, environmental breakdown that was given. And so he could live a long time there. But, but the dying process and the aging and the dying process nonetheless was there. Incidentally, I think you and I ought to do some things to uh, say, okay, I'm dying but what is it I could do to kind of slow that down? You know, what is it I could do to kind of push that off a little bit? Uh, nothing wrong with that at all. Dying thou shalt die. Now, can we take that literally? In the day that you eat thereof, thou eatest thereof, dying begins. Almost, shall we say, the day you eat of it, the clock starts ticking. <laughs> there it is. It's going to start going. And... Someday, the old ticker is going to stop ticking. 
thou shalt die. The translators of the King James, you know, looked at it and said, well, we can put a paragraph, but our job is not to put a paragraph, you know, especially for just a couple of Hebrew words. We can't put a paragraph to explain what all this means. So let's say thou shalt surely die. And let's put a translator note that explains that a little bit. And let's let people put their big boy pants on and figure it out for themselves. I think they did a good job there. You could always argue, I ah, know they should have, uh, should have said something else. Uh, but, but whatever the something else would have been, again, unless it's a paragraph of scripture, the something else would have been insufficient also. And so it was one of these things they were just kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, I think, as we uh, look at that. Excellent uh, question from uh, West Virginia. I appreciate uh, that. Uh, let's go to, uh, to Belgium today and see a question that comes from Rudy uh, in Lessines, Belgium. And it's a Romans question also. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. How is the law established through faith? And uh, we see Romans 3.31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Okay, how do we establish the law through faith? Uh, let me just uh, see if I can uh, bring up uh, Romans uh, chapter uh, 3 here in our Romans graphically presented, uh, the rough draft that I've got here on my screen. Uh, a case fulfilled, the gospel of, of all. Now we're looking at verse uh, 31. Verse 31 is the mystery revealed and, clar and, and clearly stated. So there is some mystery revealed that uh, comes about on this. But this particular verse, verse uh, 31, uh, does give us this, uh, this confusion because our faith is separated from the law. Those of us in the body of Christ are not in the law. So how in the world could we establish the law in our faith? Well, I think we, we would have to dig into some pronouns here, but uh, to, to check the we, but I think the we is end up going to be the Jewish people. But let's, let's look at something here. Let's look at the word establish. Establish is uh, the word uh, histamine. Uh, and uh, if we were to uh, look up this uh, word histamine, let me uh, pull it up here, a verb, present active indicative. indicative. Okay. Uh, it means to stand. To stand. Uh, and by the way, stasis is related. Established is also very, very closely related to the, to the Greek. It grows out of the Greek. It comes into the English language from the Greek. Uh, so we, we stand the law. Now, what, what's he saying here? We, the Jewish people, have a law, but the law falls apart without faith. The, the, the law is nothing but you know, rote action that is utterly meaningless without faith. Let me give you an example. Hey, Jews, why do you, uh, why do you cease working on the seventh day? Well, because that's what the rabbi said. Well, that just becomes legalism but you add some faith to it because God gave us this day, not only as a day of rest, but as a day to remember who he is and who we are. Gave us a day of faith. The other days are kind of pragmatic. Here is a day of faith. When you bring faith into it, all of a sudden the law stands. The law can make it. By the time you get to the book of Malachi, the Lord says, oh, I wish, you, I wish you guys would just put out the fires. What a, what a royal waste. Close the doors to the temple. I'm done with all that. Why? Because they didn't have any faith to go to it, with it. So 
do we make void the law? This is a part of the response to the, to the, to the mystery that is being given. Do we, the Jewish people, all of a sudden say, you know, the law was never any good because the law didn't have faith? No, the law had to have faith. We made the law something with faith. And it's very much a part of that. I look forward to uh, further study on that and continuing that at our uh, Branson retreat, uh, Labor Day weekend. You'll be able to catch that live online on Worshify. Still time to sign up for it if you're watching the live broadcast here anyway. And uh, we'd love to see you for that. But I'm out of time. Thanks, Rudy, for the question. And uh, thank you all for your biblical, theological, and worldview questions. Uh, we'll take 24 hours a day, seven days a week at askthetheologian.com. Find out all our teaching ministry at brandywhiteministries.org. You know, let's go ahead and take one more here today. Had a, had a follow-up question that came from uh, Stephanie uh, down in Texas. And uh, the question yesterday, I don't, think the, I don't think yesterday's question was from Stephanie. I think it might have been from uh, Valerie or someone else, but I could, I could be mixed up and confused. Uh, but we had the question about, you know, what, what do you do and say with the pastor who uh, believes that uh, the body of Christ began uh, Acts chapter 2? Now, let me read. This is a follow-up to the one yesterday about by the pastor teaching his congregation that the body of Christ, which we are part of, began uh, uh, after Acts chapter 2 uh, or, or began at Acts chapter 2. Uh, how do you respond to those who say Peter and others? I'm gonna, uh, let, me, let me set the stage here right. Our position is that the body of Christ starts after Acts chapter 2. You say that to the Acts chapter 2 pastor, and they say, no, 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 no. So the, the previous question was to show, hey, they're still living in the law. We talked about Ananias. We talked about a, being in one accord in the temple, just to show they're living in the law. So, following up at that question, what do you say to those who say, well, Peter and others were still living under the law because they just didn't understand? Or they just couldn't let go. This, I'll be, you know, maybe, maybe I'm just grumpy today. But, but I'll, I'll give them a grumpy answer. Uh, and there's a place for a grumpy answer, by the way. Uh, when, when a person is beginning not to just accept pretty clear evidence, nothing wrong with getting grumpy. And, and by grumpy, obviously, I just mean uh, stating the case somewhat boldly. Here's how I would respond. Okay, you're telling me that Peter just didn't understand. I'm telling you, that's the most arrogant statement I've heard all day. Old Dr. Wigglejaw, I've been to the seminary. I understand so much better than Peter. Well, let me ask you, did you have a 40-day seminar on the kingdom with the risen Lord when you were down there at the big box seminary? What an arrogant statement you got. This is the Apostle Peter. He had the Holy Ghost. He had a direct line of communication with God. He had that 40-day seminar, read Acts chapter 1, with the risen Lord, but he just didn't understand it. Yeah, you got to be kidding me. Pastor, come up with a better argument. Surely you can do better than this. I was talking to someone on the flat earth subject. This is on social media the other day. And in our Taos Prophecy Conference, I'm going to do a little flat earth presentation. I'm not an adherent. Uh, and, uh, and really what I said to him was the same kind of line of thinking. He put some sort of flat earth argument out there. And I said, do better. 
that's just a dumb argument. That's a straw man. That's not really, uh, you know, uh, if you're trying to convince me to be flat earth, that argument's not going to do it. You, you can do better. And uh, so I would, I would kind of take this thing here and say, you got to do better than he just didn't understand. Give me some evidence that Peter was a bonehead and, uh, you, you know, uh, mentally incompetent to understand these things. Give me some evidence there. What I see is that the Bible explicitly says that freedom from the law came later. And there is nothing prior to that time that says they were free from the law. So why was Peter the ignoramus? Why do you just throw him under the bus like that? What's up with that? Okay, it's a little rude, but it, 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 they'll remember the conversation anyway. Uh, now, the, the flip side of that, oh, they just couldn't let go of the law. Again, you are, you are accusing them. You're accusing the apostle Peter. And remember, in the joke you used last Sunday, he's the one that's going to meet you at the gate. He's the one with the keys to the kingdom. You're accusing him of being so stubborn in his religion that he couldn't get his spirituality right. Let me ask you, when you get up there and Peter meets you at the golden gates, are you going to confront him on that? Or is this just a conversation between me and you? See, I think when you push these things, they have to come up with, man, I'm bankrupt on this one. Now, they're a preacher, so they're not going to accept it very quickly, but... Uh, and they might just kick you out of the church about right then. But anyway, uh, again, I would, you know, they just couldn't let go of it. Okay, show me something prior to the time of Paul where it says they should let go of it. I'll wait. Bueller? Bueller? Well, where is it that says they should let go of it? Do you find it in the words of Jesus? Do you find it in, in uh, the, the, the uh, day of Pentecost? Do you find it in Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9? Where is it? There's nothing in there that shows them as stubborn. These are people that are willing to go to any lengths, climb any mountain, cross any river, whatever it takes. They will do it. But they just won't let go of the law. I think... Pastor, you just won't let go of your Baptist traditions. You just won't let go of your what you learned down at the seminary. You just won't go, let go with what some parrot told you all your life. I think you ought to look into the Word of God and come up with a better argument. There's my answer. It was, it was blunt. Uh, maybe grumpy is not the word. Maybe, you know, blunt is, is a better word for it. Uh, I don't know. Um, well, I, I got uh, more questions uh, there, and I didn't get to uh, all of them. My, my bad on that, but we are out of time here, and I got to run. Uh, but uh, we go uh, prepare for Romans for the rest of the day, and I uh, look forward to seeing you back tomorrow as uh, we will come into, uh, um, you know, Ask the Theologian and uh, the... Uh, Feast of uh, Jubilee tomorrow night. That'll be good. And again, if you want to sign up for that uh, Branson retreat, there is time. Randy at Randy White Ministries. Check that out. And uh, what did I offer today? I offered uh, why I'm a fundamentalist and you should be too. And uh, the essential gospel. You can uh, request that. Send, it, send me an email, randy at randywhiteministries.org. Thanks to each one of you for listening today. I appreciate that, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Catch uh, all the questions at askthetheologian.com or all the Bible teaching at randywhiteministries.org, and we shall see you soon. God bless.